Through an angel, God speaks to Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. His reign will never end. Through Mary, God speaks to us. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, whose name is Holy, who has routed the proud and all their schemes, brought down monarchs from their thrones, raised on high the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich empty away. We light our fourth candle as a sign of God's love shining in the world through people past and present. Let us pray. Living God, thank you for coming into our world. Thank you for meeting us in real people. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.
scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, beginning with the 26th verse. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this happen, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman, who was labeled unable to conceive, is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Will you pray with me, please? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. The writer, preacher Frederick Beekner once wrote the following about this morning's scene from Luke's Gospel. She struck the angel Gabriel as hardly old enough to have a child at all, let alone this child. But he had been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told her what the child was to be named and who he was to be, and something about the mystery that was to come upon her. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. And as he said it, he only hoped that she wouldn't notice beneath the great golden wings that he himself was trembling with fear to think that the whole future of creation hung now on the answer of this girl. Think back to when you were 12 or 13 or maybe even 14 years old. Some of us might have to struggle a little bit to do that, but I think we'll get there this morning. That's how old Mary would probably have been at the time of Gabriel's visit. That was the typical age of betrothal in those days. Now, to be sure, her engagement to Joseph had not been the result of a long courtship. It was to be an arranged marriage but a marriage nonetheless. She was a girl. And being a girl in that culture meant being eased out of the house as soon as possible. No sooner is she engaged to Joseph, an older man, and this happens. Now think back to when you were 12 or 13 or maybe 14 years old, or think about your children or your grandchildren when they were 12, when they were 13 or 14. Do you remember what they were like? Think about that. Let's consider what was being asked of Mary. 
this morning. First, she would become pregnant before her wedding day, which would bring shame upon her. Secondly, there existed the very great possibility that she could be stoned to death for this breach of not only custom, but also law. Thirdly, saying yes to this angel would bring shame and mockery not only upon her, but also on her whole family and possibly for generations to come. Nazareth was a small, dusty backwater of a place where everyone knew each other and everyone knew every other person's business. Keep in mind, she was only 12 or 13 or 14 at the very most. Remember when you were that age or your children? Or your grandchildren? What on earth was God thinking? And you see, that is the question that has been raised throughout the history of Christendom. Mary was an unlikely candidate to be the mother of the Savior of the world. What was God thinking? which turns out to really be the whole point of this morning's story. The unlikely people that God chooses to do the most incredible things. Little Mary is just an example in this case. She really isn't the focus of the Bible passage. God is the focus of the Bible passage. And God choosing unlikely people to carry out God's plans for thousands of years. Not always with the best of results. God's intentions and our compliance with those intentions has often left something to be desired. Remember Adam and Eve? In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve... But that didn't work out so well. As a matter of fact, it led God to becoming eventually so angry that God decided to wipe the slate clean with the exception of Noah and his family. And still, things didn't get any better. So God chose Abraham and Sarah. And they were sent from Ur in what is now Iraq to the land of Canaan. And along the way, Abraham pawned his wife Sarah off as his sister when a foreign king took a shine to her. He had some explaining to do when he tried to get her back. And then Sarah was older and still without child, When she was older and still without child, she laughed at the angel that God sent to tell her that she would have a son. At least Mary didn't laugh. And when Abraham and Sarah's offspring became enslaved in Egypt, God chose a fugitive murderer by the name of Moses to lead the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. Moses, who tripped over his tongue and stuttered at every step because he had a speech impediment, was the one that God chose to negotiate with Pharaoh, who was one of the most important men in the world at the time. And when God's first king, Saul, didn't pan out, The prophet Samuel was dispatched to a man named Jesse who had seven sons. Samuel was to choose a new king for Israel from among them. And one by one, from the oldest to the last one present, Samuel was sure that there was a king among them. But God said, no, no. So then Samuel asked Jesse if his sons were all present and accounted for, to which Jesse replied, well, no, the youngest is out with the sheep. I didn't figure you'd be interested in him. The boy's name was David. And Samuel said, yep, he's the one I'm looking for. And David became Israel's greatest king. 
But he had his problems too. You get the point. God chooses unlikely people. God chose Mary. God chose Mary of all people. Because God chooses us. And that goes without saying. But before God chose Mary, God also chose Elizabeth, Mary's relative and wife of Zechariah, who was a priest, for Elizabeth to be the mother of John the Baptist. Now, Elizabeth was an older woman and had given up on ever having a child of her own. But this time, Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and told him that his wife Elizabeth would have a son, and that son's name was to be John. Well, Zechariah was suspicious and basically talked back to Gabriel. How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. For that, Gabriel sealed Zechariah's mouth so that he couldn't speak until John was born. Now imagine a preacher not being able to speak. I can't imagine. That was downright cruel on Gabriel's part. I hope Gabriel was at least admonished for that. Mary was chosen to be the mother of God. God acted in a most unusual way, as God usually does. And here's the thing. She said, yes. She said, here am I, servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She had a choice, you see. She could have said no. Just as we are free to say no to God any time we choose, and we frequently do. She could have said, would somebody please get that angel out of here? She could have said no. And she could have gotten married to Joseph without any questions. She would still have to make that arduous journey to Bethlehem with Joseph, but she may not have been pregnant and may not have been in labor. And she and Joseph could have treated it as a second honeymoon if they had such things in those days. The angel Gabriel would then have gone to Bethlehem to find another mother for Jesus. And that couple would have been saved the journey from Nazareth. They wouldn't have needed a stable in which to give birth. And it would have been a much different story if that had happened. But Mary, Mary said, yes. Let it be, she said. Now imagine a teenager. Remember that 12, that 13-year-old, that 14-year-old? Imagine a teenager saying yes to God. And to this day, every Advent, we tell Mary's story. The problem is that it is nothing more than an interesting story unless we make Mary's story our story as well. The Annunciation is just another sweet story about an angel drawing near to the earth to engage a teenaged girl in a conversation. It's the stuff of fairy tales. This is the 21st century, and such things don't happen in the modern world. That's the attitude of many people these days. Such things just don't happen. A few months ago, Walter Brueggemann, one of the smartest men around when it comes to the the Hebrew Testament, said this, Few of our people imagine God to be an active character in the story of their lives. Let me repeat that. Few of our people imagine God to be an active character in the story of their lives. I suspect that Dr. Brueggemann is right. 
Don't get me wrong. It's not that people don't believe in God. It's more that day in and day out, God seems to most people to be fairly passive. You know, that if God is going to be doing anything, it's pretty much hanging out in the background, watching and waiting and being supportive and encouraging. Kind of like the refrain of that Bette Midler song a few years back. And God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. I don't believe that. I don't. And I hope that you don't believe it either. I have witnessed God's presence in my life, and I have witnessed God's presence in the lives of other people and other congregations as well. There's a young woman by the name of Tiffany Bell at my husband's church. She's been doing youth and children's ministry at Mission Bell, and both Paul and I have been very impressed with her not only by the job that she is doing with the children, but also with the thought that she puts into that ministry with youth and children, even on Sunday mornings during the children's moment. So not long ago, after Mission Bell's charge conference, my husband very tentatively, very carefully asked Tiffany if she had ever thought about going into ministry. And with no change in the expression on her face, she said that she had. And then Paul asked her if she believed that she had a calling, and she said that she had felt called for quite some time. And when he further asked if she was going to respond to that call, she said, yes. She said, yes. I was so excited when Paul came home and told me about their conversation because I believe that Tiffany will make a good candidate for ministry. And Paul and I hope to find ways to be able to support her in her journey just as other people supported us so many, many years ago. As her church, she will need Mission Bell's support while she pursues her calling you see, the church is always called to do this. Any candidate for the ordained ministry, the church is always called to support in some way. It's almost like giving birth to a new minister, which would not be that far off the mark for Mission Bell. Tiffany wouldn't be the first person that Mission Bell has sent into ministry. You might happen to know Bob Lind. Bob Lind was the most recent, but not the only minister to be sent forth from that congregation. You might know Jim Eck. Jim Eck is on the chaplain staff over at Thunderbird Hospital. And you might know David Wright. David Wright's a minister and a professor at the University of Puget Sound in Washington. Those folks all came out of the Mission Bell United Methodist Church. It would seem that that particular church is pregnant again by the power of the Holy Spirit. That, of course, isn't the only way that God acts in our lives. It's not just within the walls of the church that God acts. If the truth be known, God is active in all aspects of our lives, in ways with which we would sometimes agree, and maybe in some ways with which we would disagree. We've acquired the notion along the way that if things are going nicely and if life is easy, then that's God's work in our lives. That's God at work doing things in our lives. And somehow if things are not agreeable, if we are struggling or we are experiencing hardship, then either God is absent or God is in some way punishing us. Maybe that God's just trying to get our attention. When things are going well for us, when we feel warm and fuzzy and secure, we think of God less often because we don't see ourselves in any kind of need. But when we lose something from our lives, when we lose a loved one, then we remember our relationship with God. 
It's a universal character defect of our flawed humanity. We tend to forget about God. We tend to think that we do life all by ourselves until something happens to remind us just how fallible and how vulnerable we are in this human flesh. But God, God does not forget about us. God is here and now and still faithful and at work in each one of our lives. And that's where Mary's story can help us this morning. Let it be with me according to your word. We can remember that God chooses us. And we don't have to do life all by ourselves. God chooses us as unlikely as we all are to love and cherish, to inspire, to do incredible things, to give birth to God's love into the world. I have one more story that I want to tell you this morning, and I hope you will bear with me. It's not in the sermon, so I'm going off script here. But I have to tell you about something that happened last night. We were over in the chapel for the Saturday night service, and in that service, there is a portion of time at the very beginning that we use called Singing Our Faith, and it's an opportunity for people to choose hymns that they would like to sing, and we sing about four hymns. We sing the first verse of each one, and people usually just call out what it is they'd like to sing, and we had some friends with us last night, and they had some little ones with them, they had a little girl who was probably about half of Mary's age. And I saw this hand go up. And that little girl requested that we sing Jingle Bells. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, so I said to her, you know, we don't have Jingle Bells in our book that we use, but I promise you this, if you can wait until the end of the service, we will sing Jingle Bells together. How does that sound? And she nodded her head and thought that that was just fine. So we went through the service, and, and I finished preaching and praying, and then we sang our closing hymn. And then right after I did the benediction, I invited her to come up and stand with me, this tiny little thing, and I said, okay, so we're going to sing Jingle Bells now. And we made a couple of decisions about how we were going to sing it, and by golly, we all sang Jingle Bells. And then as we were going out from the service, then the rest of the congregation stood up and they sang, Let There Be Peace on Earth. And it was just wonderful. And I thought about that last night on the way home, but all through the night, that story kept mulling around in my mind. And I know that that's the way that God's Spirit works in my life and speaks to me. And it suddenly occurred to me that that little girl was an illustration of the Mary story. Half of Mary's age. And yet she was inspired. Inspired to want to participate in worship and to participate in the only way that she knew how. Because she knew the song Jingle Bells. And I remember that I said to the congregation, you know, it may not be the most liturgical of songs, but it is to her. God chooses unlikely people to inspire us. I think that whole congregation left last night feeling blessed by the small voice of a small child leading them in worship. And I was proud that as United Methodists, we have made our sanctuaries a safe place where a little girl can sing her praise to God in the only way that she knows how or, or in the way that at the moment that was how she knew she could lift up her voice and sing. I was proud that we can do that in the United Methodist Church and honor and respect and hold that as a holy moment. Because there are places where young women cannot sing, where they cannot sing praise to God. But here we empower them to do so.
You know, that's the second half of the Mary story. I thought of this this morning. I didn't think of it last night, but I thought of this this morning. There is the point after the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and, and she goes off to visit her cousin Elizabeth, but there is one moment where Mary stops and she sings. And she sings to God, and that song has become known to us as the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. In Advent, we wait, and we prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. And this morning's lesson from Luke's Gospel causes us to pose the question to ourselves, How trusting are we in God? Are we willing to allow God to lead us and guide us in all aspects of our lives? Are we willing to let God inspire us to sing? Are we able to say your will and not my will be done? No matter the consequences. We can choose, you know, We can always say, if we choose, would somebody please get that angel out of here? Or we can be one of Mary's people. We can say yes. Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. You see, it's so simple, even a 12-year-old girl can do it. Amen.